Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's edition of uh, our Extremal and Probabilistic uh, Combinatorics Seminar. Uh, and uh, let me quickly go through the, the, the usual practical. Uh, um, this talk will be recorded and post, posted online. So, you know, be aware that if you, if you ask a question or something, it, it will appear online. Uh, and uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, I prefer for practical uh, reasons to, to keep everyone muted initially. So ask your questions in the chat and uh, either it will be answered by uh, fellow uh, participant or if we see that, the, then that it there will be uh, room for questions uh, at the end of the talk. There will be, we always have like a formal part where the, the questions are recorded and then we have a, a, an informal part where you can ask stupid questions and no one will, no one will mind. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Anton Bernstein from Carnegie Mellon, and he will talk about algorithmic aspects of uh, Wiesing theorem. So please. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining me uh, in this in this seminar. I normally would say, uh, you know, thank you for joining the the, the talk so uh, early in the morning. But uh, uh, now I realize that uh, many of you probably are in different time zones from the one I am in. So this maybe is not, is not quite relevant to everybody. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about distributed algorithms for, uh, for edge powering. This is the, the, the topic of this talk. And uh, to begin with, let me uh, describe the, the basic premise of distributed algorithms as such. Uh, so uh, a distributed algorithm operates on a graph and uh, we, when we think of a graph in this context, we imagine every vertex to be some kind of entity like a computer or a processor or something of that sort. And uh, the edges of the graph are communication links between these entities. So the goal uh, is to uh, uh, solve some kind of combinatorial problem on this graph. For example, to get a coloring with, uh, uh, in this case, three colors or uh, which is more relevant for this talk, an edge coloring with some number, of, again, some given number of colors. Uh, but now every one of these vertices represents an independent entity that wants to decide on its own what its color is going to be or what are the colors of the adjacent ed of uh, edges incident to this vertex. And it doesn't care about what happens to the other vertices in the graph. Uh, so uh, yeah, so every vertex has to make a decision about its own part of the output, its own color or the colors of edges around it, things like that. Uh, the problem is that this vertex doesn't actually know what the whole network looks like. Uh, it is only aware of its neighbors in the graph and it can send messages to them and receive messages from those neighbors. And it has to make a decision about its color or the colors of its incident edges based on this communication with its, with its neighbor. And of course, all of these decisions have to be consistent. The resulting coloring actually has to be a proper coloring. Uh, so, the question that we now ask is how much communication is needed? How many rounds of sending messages back and forth are needed in order to uh, uh, solve the given combinatorial problem? So uh, just to put everything in writing and be a bit more precise, uh, uh, we're studying the model of distributed computation called the local model. It's often always stylized like this in all capitals. Uh, and it was introduced in uh, late 80s and early 90s uh, by Lineal, especially, and some other researchers. Uh, so, okay, so we are operating on a graph G, which has n vertices. Throughout the talk, n will denote the number of vertices in G. And we think of every vertex as representing a processor, while edges represent communication links. Uh, now, uh, before we proceed, it's uh, good to realize that there has to be a way of distinguishing vertices from each other in this graph. And uh, to this end, uh, every vertex is given a unique identifier, which is just a sequence of log n bits, uh, 
or you know, some constant time slog n bits, and it's guaranteed that all these sequences are distinct from each other. So in this way, any two vertices can be distinguished. Um, but initially, every vertex only knows its own identifier, or maybe its own identifier and identifiers of, of its neighbors, depending on how you set up the model. Um, so the computation proceeds in rounds, which are synchronous. So every vertex moves from one round to the next simultaneously. And during each round, the vertices first perform arbitrary local computations and then broadcast messages to their neighbors. Uh, there is no restriction on how complex the computations can be. Any computational problem can, sol can be solved by an individual vertex in a, a single time step here. And the messages can be as long as you like. There is no restriction there either. Uh, at the end, after some number of communication rounds, every vertex has to output its own part of the global solution. So either its own color or the colors of the incident edges or you know, things of that sort, depending on which kind of problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and the uh, complexity of such an algorithm is measured by the number of rounds required. So again, uh, local computations can be arbitrarily complex and the, the messages can be arbitrarily long. The only thing we care about is how many rounds are needed. Um, yeah, at this point I should add that most of the time in this talk I will be thinking about deterministic uh, local algorithms, uh, which is what I just described. And there, there is also a randomized variant of, of this model where in addition to, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this setup that, that we have here, every vertex can generate a sequence of uniformly random bits that is arbitrarily long. And it can use these bits somehow to, you know, in its computation, and it can also send the values of these bits to, to its neighbors, compare them with their, values of its neighbors, etc. cetera. Uh, and in the randomized version, the algorithm has to succeed with uh, sufficiently high probability. Um, all right, so uh, this is, this is, the, this is the, the general framework of distributed algorithms. Let me give you a, oh, yeah, before, before giving an example, maybe, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should uh, uh, say, why is this called the local model? What is, so, what is local about it? Uh, the reason is that because of the uh, complexity of the local computations uh, is relevant, what the model is really measuring is some kind of locality of the problem in the sense that it's asking how far in the graph a vertex needs to look in order to decide what its color it is. So the relevant observation is that if the algorithm runs for T rounds, say, uh, then every vertex within T rounds only has access to information in its uh, radius T neighborhood in the graph, right? In one round, it communicate with its communicates with its neighbors. In two rounds, it communicates with its neighbors who have already communicated with their neighbors. So now it's, the information moves distance two in the graph. In three rounds, it goes distance three, et cetera. So really, you can think of a local algorithm as a function uh, that as input, takes the isomorphism type of the radius T ball around a given vertex in the graph, where this ball is labeled. Every vertex has to remember its ID. So it's part of the, part of the input for the function. And it has to produce the output of X, whatever color X has or whatever colors the edges uh, incident to X have, or whatever other problem you're solving. So uh, you don't have to think about it algorithmically. Uh, and sometimes it's more convenient to, to, to realize that really what is happening is we're asking whether or not there is a function that uh, looks at these you know, isomorphism types of balls of some given radius in the graph and outputs colors based on those isomorphism types of all. Uh, so that's why it's called the local model. Uh, okay, so in particular, every problem can be trivially solved in the number of rounds, which is a uh, big O of the diameter of the graph, just because, uh, in this many rounds, every vertex can communicate with every other vertex. So uh, the locality becomes irrelevant. Uh, and so usually we're looking for algorithms that run faster than this trivial bound. And the uh, standard benchmarks are something like a polynomial in the logarithm of the number of vertices. This is uh, considered, you know, you know, typically considered the, where, where efficient algorithms begin. Uh, or maybe you can ask for something that is just big O of log n rounds, or even sublogarithmic, uh, etc. Uh, so let me give you a quick example. Uh, 
Ah, there is a question. Are there any memory restrictions? Uh, uh, no memory restrictions. A vertex can so so when the vertex looks at the ball of radius t here, it remembers the entire isomorphism type and, and it's fine. Right. So so uh, uh, yeah, there are, vertices are omnipotent somehow. The only problem is that they the the uh, the distance in the graph they can look at, at is restricted. Really, that's the, that's that's what's going on. So let me give you an example. Here's a very simple graph G. It's a path. Uh, on n vertices. Uh, of course, this graph is, is bipartite. Uh, here's a covering with two colors. Uh, however, I claim that uh, uh, there is no algorithm that finds such a two coloring within a little o of n rounds. So the diameter of this graph is n, or n over 2, linear in n. And uh, I claim that one cannot do better. Uh, no sublinear algorithm can find a two coloring. And the reason essentially is because, well, a two coloring is a very non-local problem, right? A color of one vertex over here already determines the color of a vertex down here all the way in the other part, end of the path. So here's a sketch of a proof. Suppose that there is such an algorithm. What does this mean? This is our path. Look at this vertex here. It looks at its uh, ball of radius little o of n. And so it looks at what's happening here. And based on this information, it decide what its color, decides what its color is going to be. Now, because it's little o of n, I can fit in a bunch of other these, uh, a bunch more of these intervals in the, of such intervals in the, in this path, and they all can make them all disjoint from each other. In fact, I can even arrange that this vertex is at even distance from the vertex we started with, and this one is at odd distance by moving these things a little bit, right? Now, of course, this is a two coloring algorithm, which means that these two vertices that are at even distance from each other have to get the same color, and the two vertices at odd distance have to get different color. And now you can see what I can do. I can just, well, what do the vertices see? They see a path around them with some identifiers attached to the vertices there. Well, let's switch the identifiers for the vertices in this path and in this one. And now this vertex will output the same color that this one did before and vice versa. So now suddenly these two vertices at even distance have, have distinct colors. And um, that's a contradiction. Uh, okay, so this shows that two coloring is, is non-local. Well, how about three coloring. I mean, how many colors do you need? Uh, just, you know, to complete this slide, uh, let me say that uh, a pretty a fairly early result of Colin Bishkin shows that in particular, uh, if you want to three color a path, uh, then uh, we can do it using a, a big O of log star n round algorithm, where log star is the iterated logarithm, is the number of times the log function has to apply it, it has to be applied to make uh, the uh, iteratively applied to make the answer less than one. So it's the inverse of the tower function, I guess. Uh, so it's pretty small. Uh, so once we move from two to three, the situation improves dramatically. Uh, all right. Uh, so this is a simple example that shows that at least it's sort of an non-trivial non -trivial notion. And of course, uh, in this talk, I'm going to care about edge coloring rather than vertex coloring. So in edge coloring, just to remind you, edges sharing a vertex must get different colors. Uh, and uh, we'll know that if a graph G has maximum degree delta, then by theorem of Vising, it's delta plus one edge colorable. Uh, of course, if, a vert if there is a vertex of degree delta, all the edges incident to that vertex have to be colored delta. So the answer, so it's impossible to get an edge coloring with fewer than delta colors. And it turns out that delta plus one is always enough. Uh, well, what we want to know is whether there are efficient distributed algorithms for, what efficient distributed algorithms are there for edge coloring? Maybe not even with delta plus one colors, with some number of colors. And, uh, uh, you know, at this point, I should say, you know, if, if uh, if a mathematician uh, wrote a, 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 a murder mystery, it would be called The Butler Did It. Uh, based on the title of my talk, you can already predict when I'm going with this. Uh, however, because, before stating the main result of this talk, I would like to maybe give a brief survey of uh, other results about distributed algorithms for edge coloring. Uh, and uh, I should say that there is a lot of work done on, on this. and. Uh, 
uh, I'm not going to mention all the results that are known, but just uh, some kind of representative sample. So uh, the first thing one can start with is uh, uh, consider the question. So I guess we know that Wiesing's theorem uh, guarantees a coloring with delta plus one colors, but maybe one can get particularly efficient uh, distributed, alg uh, distributed algorithms with, with more than that many colors. And a, a natural threshold to start the investigation from is two delta minus one. Uh, the reason being that in a graph of maximum degree delta, every edge is adjacent to at most two delta minus two edges, which means that now we're giving more colors to an edge than there are possible conflicts in which it can be involved. So such a coloring, if we, instead of a distributed way algorithm, we look for a normal sequential algorithm, such a coloring can be found greedily. Can be found greedily. So this is the threshold for a greedy algorithm. And one can hope that because of this, with this many colors, one should be able to get a really efficient distributed algorithms as well. So uh, again, one of the earlier results in the area by Luby and independently Alan, Babai and Itai uh, implies that uh, there is such an algorithm that runs in big O of log n rounds, uh, but the algorithm is randomized. Uh, and on the other hand, if you, want to, if you want a deterministic algorithm, there is also an early result of Goldberg, Plotkin and Shannon uh, that gives a bound of big O of delta squared plus log star n. This is again the iterated log of n. So this is a really small, slow growing function of n. Uh, but then there is this big O of delta squared term. So if delta is say, you know, if delta is small, then this is, this is wonderful. But if delta is uh, fairly large compared to, to n, then this in principle can be even, you know, can be even worse than this randomized algorithm in terms of the number of rounds. So a very, an early question in the area that has been around for a while is whether or not one can um, find a deterministic algorithm uh, for this problem that operates in the number of steps that runs that's polynomial in log n, independent of the value of the maximum degree, even if it can be large compared to n. Uh, and this turns out to be a difficult problem. There have been very many results uh, uh, related to this question, but the, the, the final outcome is that the answer is yes. And this is a recent result of Fischer, Gaffari, and Kuhn to give an algorithm that works in this many rounds. Uh, all right, so this is two delta minus one. Let's go further. We want to get to delta plus one eventually. So let's look at fewer than two delta minus one colors. What do we know about that? Uh, well, one thing to say is that the problem immediately gets more complicated, even if you go to two delta minus two colors already, uh, uh, it is known that then there is a lower bound of the order log n over log delta, which means that, say, uh, for a constant delta, this is uh, this such, any such algorithm requires at least logarithmic number of rounds, uh, whereas uh, just for comparison, I mentioned on the previous slide that uh, two delta minus one edge coloring can be found in uh, this many rounds, which if delta is constant, is, this is essentially just log star of n. Uh, so this is a very slow growing function, much less than log n. But if we just subtract one color, then, then, then it's impossible to go below the log n threshold. But this is, I have to say, this is true for deterministic algorithms. With randomized algorithms, uh, this log, log n threshold can be, can be uh, 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 breached the same, uh, in the same paper, these authors, uh, presented a randomized algorithm for delta plus little of delta edge coloring uh, that works in uh, big O of uh, log delta times uh, something polynomial in log log n rounds. And uh, here I should say that, well, I'm not being completely uh, precise when I say that this is how many rounds the algorithm they presented requires. Uh, the algorithm depends on a certain subroutine and depending on how quickly one can solve the one the subroutine can operate, uh, the speed of this algorithm changes. So the precisely the value of polynomial in log log n comes from a very recent work of Rajan and Gaffari. Uh, so this is this is somehow best known of what we what, what we know now. We can plug in, in in this setup of this algorithm. And the point is that you can see differences between deterministic and randomized algorithms here. Uh, now, if we really want deterministic algorithms, uh, the first 
uh, result where the number of colors is less than two delta minus one is this uh, this this theorem of Grappari, Kuhn, Maus, and Uito, uh, which uh, gives three delta over two edge coloring in the number of rounds that's polynomial in delta and log n. And this is a deterministic algorithm. Uh, and the closest to delta plus one one can get prior to the result that we'll be talking about in this talk is this, this theorem of Su and Wu, uh, which so they only require delta plus two colors, one more than in Bising's theorem, and the algorithm operates in number of runs that's polynomial in delta and log n, but it's randomized. Uh, however, uh, this recent work of Rojan and Ghaffari, uh, they, in, they, they in particular involves a general derandomization technique, which allows one to make the, actually turn this algorithm into a deterministic one. So really now we know that there is a deterministic algorithm that runs a number of rounds polynomial in delta and log n, and it produces a delta plus two edge coloring of the graph G. So which is one more than the Vising theorem bound. I will uh, say later in the talk where, why it's delta plus two, where the extra color is used. Uh, but the main result that I want to, want to report in this, in this talk is that actually you don't need the extra color. Exactly the same statement is true for delta plus one colors. So uh, there is a deterministic algorithm that runs a poly log, polynomial in delta and log n number of rounds, and it produces a delta plus one each coloring. So exactly what the bound that Wiesing's theorem gives. And uh, yeah, just to, to emphasize somehow, uh, no known trivial bounds for delta plus one edge colorings were known before. So uh, nothing worse than this was known either, except for the trivial, you know, linear in the diameter of the graph bound. And the reason is that Wiesing's theorem is uh, very, the usual proof of Wiesing's theorem is very non-local. I, uh, I will explain uh, a bit later what I mean by that, but somehow there is a certain challenge one has to overcome. Uh, so uh, how can we pr prove this? Well, Let's, okay, this is just notation. I'm going to fix from now on the graph G on N vertices with uh, vertex set V and edge set E. And uh, uh, let's try to remember how Wiesing's theorem is proved. Uh, the way the usual proof proceeds is, well, one color stage is one in the graph one at a time. And uh, so uh, on each stage, there is some of the edges already colored. And now we take an uncolored edge and we want to modify the coloring somehow so that this uncolored edge can become can be made colored. There is one question in the chat oh, whether yeah. your result also uh, relies on Rosvon and Gaffari. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, I have, uh, it, it depending on how you finish. Yeah, there, there's, there's some variation in how, on how you can finish it, but really it, it doesn't. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 it relies on some other uh, 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 deep recent results in distributed computing, though. So, uh, 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 I'll mention that in a bit. Oh, there is another question I just noticed. Uh, the question is, is there a lower bound against improving the dependence on delta? That's a very good question. So as, as you can see here, delta, there's, there's a polynomial in delta here, right? And the best, abstractly, the best lower bound has delta in the denominator, actually. So now the higher delta should, should make your life easier. So uh, in, in the same paper, uh, they give a, a, a lower bound for algorithms of a certain type, which is uh, at least delta times log n. So delta is at least featuring as a polynomial function there, but it is only for algorithms of certain specific form. And this algorithm is of that form. So uh, somehow in that category, uh, except for the exponent of delta, you cannot, 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 cannot uh, improve it. But in principle, it is, there is no reason to uh, uh, think that the best possible algorithm will depend on delta in this way. Um, uh, yeah, if there are any more questions, feel free, feel free to, to, uh, to ask. Um, yeah, where was I going? Oh yeah, uh, augmenting subgraphs. So, so the idea is that some of the edges are already colored and we're given an uncolored edge, which we want to make colored somehow. Maybe we change the coloring a bit and then we extend it to this edge. So this, this uh, is, uh, you can capture this idea by notion of an augmenting subgraph. So, 
let's fix a partition of the edge set into sets x and u, and let phi be a partial proper delta plus one edge coloring with the main x. And the colors are going to be one, two, up to delta plus one. Uh, so x are the colored edges, and u are the uncolored ones. And we're going to say that the subgraph h is augmenting if it satisfies two conditions. First, at least one edge of h has to be uncolored. And secondly, there is going to be some other proper coloring, say c, uh, which colors both the edges that were already colored by phi and also all the edges of h. So it extends the coloring to all of these uncolored edges that are, that are present in h in a way that agrees with the original coloring on edges in x minus the edges of h. So every edge that is not in the subgraph retains its color, it doesn't change. We are allowed to modify the colors of the edges in the subgraph, and the goal is to extend the coloring to all of these uncolored edges in the graph H. And if this is possible, then the graph is augmenting, uh, because modifying the coloring on the subgraph increases the, this, the, the set of colored edges. OK. So uh, the way one usually proves Wiesing's theorem is by finding augmenting subgraphs of a certain special form, which I'm going to call Wiesing chains. Uh, so a Wiesing chain looks like this. There is an uncolored edge here in the beginning. Then there is a fan, what's called a fan of edges. This is a collection of edges that are all sharing this one vertex. Uh, and then to this fan, an alternating path is attached, where alternating means that the colors of the edges on the path are switching between some two colors, say alpha and beta, or blue and red in this picture. So this is the type of structure that Wiesing finds. And, the, and you can find an alternate, uh, the point is that you can find an augmenting subgraph of this form. This is how you prove Wiesing's theorem usually. And well, there are two problems with this. Uh, so one problem is, uh, or well, problems. The problems if you want to adapt this, algorithm, uh, this argument to the uh, distributed setting. One problem is that uh, it is impossible to treat edges one at a time. Uh, in the proof of Wiesing's theorem, we just color one edge, extend the coloring to include one edge and then another one. Uh, and uh, uh, well, now we have to, since this is a distributed algorithm, we have to do several edges at once. At least a non-negligible non proportion of the colored edges has to be uh, somehow fixed in one, in one stage of the algorithm. Uh, so this is one problem, which is maybe not as bad. Uh, there is a question, let me quickly answer. Is all of the fun uncolored? No, only the first edge. The first edge is uncolored. All the other edges in the fan are colored uh, with some colors. So in the whole picture, there is exactly one uncolored edge, this first one. Uh, yes, so we need somehow to build these uh, augmenting, many augmenting subgraphs at a time that don't interact with each other. Uh, but secondly, there is a much worse problem, is that this Wiesing chain can, be, can have large diameter. This alternating path can be long, in principle linear in the number of vertices in the graph, which means that this poor uncolored edge that wants to be colored. It's trying to prove Wiesing's theorem for itself. It finds this fan, but it cannot actually complete the alternating path. It cannot tell the edges at the other end of the path to change their color somehow, uh, because the path is so long. So in the, in the small number of rounds, it can, we cannot even discover this entire path. Uh, so this is the non-locality of Wiesing's theorem somehow. And uh, well, uh, in order to prove, to get such a distributed algorithm, we have to overcome both of those difficulties, and this is exactly what one can do if instead of Wiesing chains, one's consider more com one considers more complicated augmenting subgraph. So um, here's, a, here's the, really the main theorem of this talk. Uh, it's a bit lengthy, so let, let's go over this. So again, we have a fixed partition of the vertex set, of the, sorry, of the edge set of the graph, and uh, we have a color, proper coloring of the edges in X, and the edges in U are uncolored. Then, well, if n is large enough so that my constants are set up correctly, uh, uh, one can find a subset w of uncolored edges, which is not too small. It's at least the size, the size of all the uncolored edges divided by something polynomial in delta n log n. So this is this non-negligible fraction of the edges, uh, such that it is possible to assign to every edge in w an a connected augmenting subgraph, let's call it he, with the following three properties. First, 
uh, E is the unique uncolored H in the subgraph. So really this augmenting subgraph is augmenting the coloring so that E becomes colored. That's the point. Uh, secondly, these subgraphs don't interact with each other. They're vertex disjoint, which means that you can do the augmentations for all of them simultaneously. Uh, so in this way, a non-negligible proportion of the uncolored edges can be incorporated in one, in one step. And thirdly, and most importantly, all of these subgraphs are small. The number of edges in each of these subgraphs is at most something polynomial in delta and log n. Uh, so in particular, this implies that the diameter of this graph is also less than this because the graph is connected. Uh, so this is really, so we're replacing Bising chains by some other subgraphs in a way that doesn't have those two problems I mentioned on the previous slide. And I have to say that, so this is an existence statement. I'm just saying there exists this set and there exists this assignment of subgraphs. But actually, once you prove this theorem, uh, you don't have to do anything else or almost, you have to do almost nothing else to, to finish the uh, uh, distributed algorithm for delta plus one H coloring. And the reason is that there are powerful approximation algorithms for hypergraph maximum matching that you can use. Uh, so in this setting, you can imagine that each of these possible augmenting subgraphs is an edge in a hypergraph, and you want to get a collection of them that the vertex is joined. So a matching in the hypergraph. And this theorem tells you that there is a matching that is a, of, an, of, or no, of size at least this much. And you can use an approximation algorithm for hypergraph maximum matching to find a maximum matching that's not too much smaller than, to, to find a matching that's not too much smaller than that in this hypergraph. And essentially, if you use these, these results as black boxes, then uh, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward to deduce the delta plus one coloring algorithm from this existence theory. So really proving this existence result is, is where the difficulty lies, where all the work lies. So, uh, um, are there any questions at this point? This is a good place to ask more questions. Um, uh, so in the rest of the talk, I'll try to uh, say something about how to prove this. Where do these uh, subgraphs H, E come from? Uh, so for simplicity, for the rest of the talk, I will assume that we are in the case when delta is a constant, independent of M. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to, uh, Every function that depends only on delta, I will uh, move into the asymptotic notation so that I don't have to carry it with me. Uh, so let's fix a proper delta plus one h coloring, partial, and an uncolored h, e, with what endpoints say x and y. Uh, so uh, instead of you know, sketching, giving the proof of the whole, or sketching the proof of the whole theorem, I'll outline the strategy for proving the following simpler statement, that for this particular edge, there is an augmenting subgraph whose only uncolored edge is E with at most uh, O of log n squared edges, uh, where this O may depend on delta. Uh, so of course, it's just finding one small augmenting subgraph, but the same ideas can allow you to do, to, to, to do many of them at once. So really, this is, this is the, the, the core of the, of the problem. Uh, and so curiously, uh, the proof approach is uh, uh, very much inspired by recent developments in a different area of, of uh, math that is not uh, obviously related to distributed computing, namely uh, the area called descriptive combinatorics. And uh, I don't want to say very much about what this is, but just because I think it's a very, in some sense, unexpected connection. Uh, let me say a few words about what this is so that you feel that this is unexpected. Uh, so descriptive combinatorics is the study of questions on infinite graphs uh, with additional topological or measure theoretic constraints. So what do I mean by this? Uh, well, a typical graph that you might look at is, is, is this graph that I have drawn here. The vertex set is the unit circle. So the graph is infinite. Every point in the circle is a vertex of the graph. And I put an edge between two vertices if uh, they're connected by a rotation by a fixed angle alpha. So I have drawn here a, a, a few of the edges in this graph. So this is a graph on infinite vertex set, but with finite maximum degree. So a lot of questions about normal combinatorial questions that you would ask about finite graphs also make sense in this setting. And moreover, the vertex set is not just some arbitrary infinite set, it's the unit circle. It's a, you know, it has a, it has a topology, it has a probability measure in it, you can uniformly choose a point in the circle. So you can study the interactions between the combinatorics of this graph and the structure of the underlying space. 
whatever those interactions might be. Uh, uh, and so it doesn't really matter exactly what this, this area is about, but this is somehow it's about infinite graphs and topology measure, things of that sort. But it turns out that a lot of the difficulties that one faces when dealing with uh, these infinite graphs are in some ways very similar to uh, difficulties one has to deal with in uh, distribu when de 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 designing distributed algorithms somehow. Uh, there is a close analogy between a lot of problems in these area two areas, even though the problems come from different sources. Uh, moreover, there are also some formal implications between results in these two areas. Uh, and so in this particular instance, uh, the uh, techniques that we're going to use uh, come from the work of uh, uh, Grebic and Pihurko, who recently solved an important problem in descriptive combinatorics, namely they proved a measurable version of Wiesing's theorem. So this is some kind of version of Wiesing's theorem for infinite graphs on the probability space. Uh, but somehow they also had to deal with this non-locality problem and the controlling the length of the alternating path uh, there. And so they developed some techniques for that. And the, our approach is uh, essentially an extension of these techniques and the generalization of them. So let me now, so in the, in the, in the remainder of the talk, I'll try to sort of very informally sketch what these techniques are uh, and what, what one needs to do to, to prove the theorem. So let, let's look at the Wiesing chain again. So now you can see that the fan is colored except for the first edge, right? So if a Wiesing chain is supposed to be an augmenting subgraph, then it means that I should be able to change the coloring of the edges in a way that uh, 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 extends the coloring to this edge. And with Wiesing chains, one always does this in the same way. One shifts the color, so every color moves to the left. Uh, in this picture that, I, that, I, that I've drawn. So the fan sort of rotates and the alternating path moves and then the last edge gets colored with the, the remaining color. And so again, Wiesing showed that there is a shiftable chain like this where the word shiftable means that uh, the coloring that results after the shifting operation is a proper coloring and hence the original chain was augmented. Uh, okay, but of course the problem is that the path is too long. This alternating path may be too long and, and then we are in trouble. Uh, well, one idea of how to deal with this long path was uh, 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 introduced in the work of Su and Wu. They say, look at this path. If it's too long, then just truncate it, stop at some point, instead of going all the way down the path. So pick some edge on this path, x prime, y prime, say, and let's call the path up to this edge p0. And instead of shifting this whole situation, just shift this initial segment. So shift the fan and shift the P0 part. Well, now the problem is that this edge, X prime, Y prime is uncolored. Uh, what do we do with this? Well, Su and Wu say, huh, we are going to allow ourselves to use one extra color. This is where the extra color in their algorithm comes. Uh, we're going to use a color number delta plus two for this uncolored edge. And now, now we've extended the color. Uh, so let's, Imagine that we are repeating this for every uncolored edge, and you can do this in parallel if you, if you set things up correctly. What will happen at the end? When all the edges are colored, they will be colored with colors one through delta plus two. And uh, uh, as far as colors one up to delta plus one are concerned, they will form a proper coloring. The only problem is that these extra edges with color delta plus, you know, with this last extra color might in principle be adjacent to each other. There is no uh, reason why they shouldn't be. However, uh, uh, Su and Wu showed that if you choose this edge at random, rather than just, you know, picking whichever edge it might be, if you pick it randomly, then uh, with high probability, no two blocking edges will be adjacent. And it means that one will have actually a, a proper delta plus two edge coloring. This is the essence of their algorithm, their randomized algorithm for delta plus two edge coloring. Uh, but we cannot do this because we don't have an extra color. Uh, so, uh, and neither could Grebic and Pihurku in their work of, on measurable vision theorem do that because they also only had delta plus one colors to work with. So their idea was, well, if we cannot use an extra color for the uncolored edge, I mean, we know how to deal with uncolored edges. You have to build a vision chain on it. You have to build a fan and, a, and an alternating path. So let's just do it again. Let's build a second fan and a second alternating path. So we have a second vision chain. So the structure looks now a bit more complicated. We have a fan here and then the path, 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 
Then we stop here at x prime y prime because we don't want the path to become too long. And then we do a different path and a different alternating path. So the picture, let's call it p prime. So the picture looks somewhat like this. Uh, this turns out to be an extremely useful idea. And just with this setup alone, uh, it is already possible to get an, uh, to argue that there has to exist an augmenting subgraph with big O of square root of n edges, which is a non-trivial bound. Uh, you know, with a priori, a vising chain can be of linear size, and this is a square root of n size. Uh, although, of course, what we want at the end is uh, something polylogarithmic in n, rather than square root of n. But uh, let me uh, first uh, explain what goes into getting the square root of n because it's simpler than the log n squared part. And some of the same ideas reappear again. So, uh, okay. So we want to get an augmenting subgraph with square root of n edges using this two-step uh, uh, two vising chain construction. Uh, so of course, this, this initial part, we, just because we truncate, uh, we're going to truncate the, the path so that this initial part is of length at most square root of n. So this edge x prime y prime, let's choose it randomly. I'm on the first square root of n edges of, the, of this path. And now we want to show that the expected length of the path p prime is still less than big O of square root of n. Then we would be done, because then this part is square root n and this part is square root n um, with positive probability. Uh, all right. So how do we bound this expected length? Well, fix an arbitrary vertex in the graph. What is the prob and let's bound the probability that this path p prime contains the vertex u. If we can get a good upper bound on that, we'll get an upper bound on the expected length. Okay, so this is our question. For a fixed vertex u, what's the probability that p prime contains it? And I'm going to give an argument that is not quite correct. So I'm, I'm announcing this right away. Don't think that I'm trying to hide this from you. And in the next slide, I'll explain how to deal with the problem, or what the problem is and how to deal with it. Uh, but for now, for now, bear with me. Here's a here's a an argument that has a subtle error in it, uh, but it provides the right intuition somehow. So here's our two-step vising chain, and I'm oh, sorry, two-step vising chain, and I'm looking at the vertex u, and I'm asking what's the probability that u happens to be on p prime. Well, let's say this vertex is u, happened to be u. It doesn't have to be the end vertex of p prime. It could be any other one, but say this one. Uh, the key observation is that if you tell me what the colors gamma and delta are, I can follow this gamma delta path up to this endpoint. This is the last point of this path, and it's adjacent to x prime. So if I know gamma and delta, I can get within the neighborhood of x prime, and hence I the number of options for x prime becomes at most delta. And since there are at most delta plus one options for gamma and delta plus one options for delta, I get a total of big O of delta cubed options for x prime, uh, for which u is, can possibly be in the path p prime. Right, again, if you give me u, then I just need to specify gamma, delta, and which of the neighbors of this last vertex x prime is. So that's where the delta cube comes from. And I'm assuming that delta is a constant. So there is really a constantly many vertices x prime for which u would be in the path p prime. Uh, but remember, how do we pick x prime? We pick it uniformly at random among the first square root n vertices in the path. Which, so any individual vertex happens to be x prime with probability one over root n at most. And there are finite, you know, there are constantly many vertices x prime which would give you, which would put you in this path p prime. So the probability that you use in p prime is still some constant times one over root n at most. And of course, this is exactly what we want because now the expected length of the path is at most the sum over all the vertices of these probabilities, which is at most n times one over root n which, is, which gives us big O over 10, which is what we wanted. So uh, this is lovely. This is a wonderful argument, except that it doesn't quite work. Uh, the reason why it doesn't quite work is because, unfortunately, the picture doesn't have to look as nice as I, as I drew it uh, on those previous slides. Uh, and the problem is that P prime may intersect the fan F or this path P0. And here's a picture of a P prime intersects P0. So here's my first fan. Uh, here's this path. I'm truncating it here. So this is x prime, y prime. Here's a new fan. And this is my path p prime going along this way. Now you might say, wait a second, p prime is supposed to be, oh, by the way, in this situation, gamma is equal to alpha. And so both of those colors are just red in this picture. But still, 
P prime is supposed to be alternating and this part doesn't look alternating. It has three different colors in it. Well, the thing is that it only has to be alternating after we shift P zero, right? Because we first shift the, the, the first wheezing chain and then we build the second one. So if I shift, if I shift the, the P zero colors to make this edge uncolored, now this path actually is uh, alternating and it's exactly going to be the P prime that, I, that, that we construct, right? And, uh, uh, and, 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 and why, is this, why is this an issue? Because before we shifted, since we don't know where we, you know, where we stop, where X prime and one prime are, before we shifted this path, uh, this prime path indeed isn't alternating. And if we start tracing our steps back from U using two colors, we will not arrive at this vertex at the end. At this point, something is going to go wrong. So the calculation fails. Uh, the calculation really assumed that P prime didn't intersect F or P zero. Uh, so to finish the argument then, we need to somehow force P prime to be disjoint from all of this previous stuff so that the picture actually does look like this. Uh, and okay, there are two things to do. We need to make it disjoint from the fan F, which is uh, not very difficult. Uh, I don't want to say much about this, just, just because the fan is so small, it's just a bound, you know, bounded number of edges. The real difficulty is getting P prime disjoint from P zero because P zero is a you know, square root of n length pi. Uh, so wh why should they be disjoint? And we want them to be edge disjoint, I should say, because the problem is, is that what happens in this picture is that this edge belongs to both of the paths and we want to avoid this. Uh, so how can we do this? Well, here's a clever idea of Grebic and Pihorko. They noticed that uh, one can choose uh, uh, the path P prime in a somewhat clever way so as to have some control over what these colors gamma and delta are. Specifically, one can ensure that either they're disjoint from the colors alpha and beta that we used on the path P zero, or if they're not disjoint, that they're exactly the same two colors. And if this is the case, then we are completely, then we're done because edges in P prime and P zero have different colors. They cannot overlap. And in the second case, they could in principle overlap, but they cannot intersect transversely. If uh, they intersect, then one of them has to be a subset of the other essentially. And this is a very special situation that one again can show is, is unlikely. Uh, I don't want to say much, too, too much more about this. Um, okay, so uh, are there any questions? So this is the square root of n bound using the two-step piecing chain. We want a log n squared bound instead, so in something better. So what we do, we do the, the natural next thing, we consider multi-step piecing chain. Uh, so this is a picture of a multi-step piecing chain. There's a fan, a path, a fan, a path, a fan, a path, etc. cetera. Uh, so the structure gets quite complicated now. Uh, and we're gonna bound the length of which path pi by some number l, which is going to be some, you know, a constant times log n, where a constant is quite large. So a, imagine L is a large constant times log n. So this is the length of each of the parts individually. And what we are hoping is that this whole construction terminates within the first log n steps. Let's call it T. T is log n steps. Why, why is this good for us? Because then the total length of the situation is like T bits and each bit of length L, and both of those are logarithmic. So we get exactly the big O of log n squared, which is what we want. Uh, 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 there is a there is a question maybe, uh, which okay the question is okay maybe I'll, I'll answer this question later because I want to I want to clarify it so uh, uh, yeah let 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 let, 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 let let's move on from uh, for for now uh, okay so this is a uh, log n log n squared which is what we want. So how do we bound the, the, uh, the number t? How do we know that the algorithm stop, stops within t steps? Well, again, one can perform some kind of naive calculation uh, under the assumption that the picture actually looks as nice as I drew it and nothing intersects anything, right? Uh, so, and you do a very similar calculation as, as we did in the two-step case. Uh, so take a vertex in the graph. What are the odds that this vertex lies in the path number t? in the path pt. Uh, well, previously we said that there are at most uh, something like delta cubed choices for the vertex x prime. Now there are many vertices to pick and there's the vertex x1, x2, x3, etc., up to xt. 
And the claim is that the right most delta to the power of big O of t, such sequences, which would make u be in the, uh, in the path pt. And this is essentially because of the same tracing back argument. If u is somewhere here on this path, you can trace two colors back uh, and, and obtain the vertex, in this case, x4. And this requires big O of delta, delta q choices. Uh, then from x4, you can go back to x3. Again, there, again, there are delta cubed options. Then to x2, et cetera, all the way to x1. So the whole sequence is delta to big O of t options. So the probability that you use in this path is at most delta to big O of t over L to the t, because each of these vertices is chosen uniformly at random from a set of L options. Uh, and now if you sum over u, well, what is the probability that the process runs for at least t steps? Well, it means that the path pt exists. It has to contain at least one vertex in it, which means that this probability is at most the sum over all the vertices, the probability that they belong to this path, which is n times this fraction. And now if you remember what l and t are and we plug these numbers in, uh, this is something quite small. As n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. This is essentially one over you know, n over a log n to the power log n. Uh, of course, this only works if the paths are disjoint from each other. And in fact, you might think based on the two-step situation that this disjointness is really, you know, like with some lo little bit of cleverness, you can just, just ensure it. And it doesn't change the situation too much. But actually, uh, here, if the paths were somehow guaranteed to be disjoint, we could have replaced the log n squared by just log n because this, this L could have just been a large constant and this number would still be small. Uh, we really are paying an extra log n factor to make the paths disjoint. This is the reason why, why the log n squared appears because the disjointness is needed. Uh, so let me, let me very briefly sketch the idea of the, where disjointness comes from. So let's say for i bigger than j, let's, e, let e, let, let's eij be the uh, random event that the first intersection is between the paths pi and pj. So in this picture, it's E three zero is what happens, right? We go, go, go. And then the third path intersected the zeroth one. And then the first, the first intersection happens there. Uh, so using the, essentially the idea of Grebek and Pihurko, you can eliminate somehow the possibility that I is J plus one. And this, this is crucial. Uh, uh, so I'm going to assume that I is at least J plus two. So somehow by, by choosing the colors appropriately, one can make sure that if the, the case I equals J plus one doesn't happen. Uh, so now if this is our picture, what's the probability of this event? Well, uh, look at the first intersection point of the paths, uh, I guess, pj and pi. Let's call it, say, u. It's a point on the path pj, so there are L options for it uh, at most. Now, if you, now you can trace everything back from this point because there are no intersection points prior to it. So uh, this is the, only, the first point where the problem occurs. So you can go back the way we did before do this whole tracing and you spent you know roughly delta cubed each time and so uh the total number of steps in this case it's three right when you go from three to zero there are three steps we take in general it would be i minus j steps so this is this fraction that one gets uh so this is l because there are so many choices for you and this is uh, the probability for each individual u. so anyway the conclusion is that the probability of this event is bounded by something of this sort to some constant c which is roughly three and uh, and once we have this bound, we can we can we can calculate the probabilities that the paths are intersecting. So so you want to say that the probability that the paths are not disjoint is at most well some kind of union bound, you know, which was the first intersection point. So the sum over all j from zero to t minus two, and from i from j plus two to t. And I am emphasizing that this starts from j plus two here because we are assuming that i is at least j plus two, because if two consecutive paths intersect, then or rather intersections of two consecutive paths we somehow avoid by choosing the colors uh, in a clever way. And then we get the, this probability. And if you rewrite this a little bit by introducing next to variable k for i minus j minus one, you see that this is some kind of, gem and you know, increasing the summation all the way to infinity. This is a geometric series, which can be summed up. And it's crucial that the summation starts from one, so because of this, the sum is actually small. We get this L in the denominator here because of that. So the, the, the calculation is this, but okay, there's some constant, which is delta to some constant power. And essentially on top we have T and on the bottom we have L. This is big O of T over L. Now remember T was logarithmic. We needed T to be like log N, but we made L 
even bigger. We made it like a large constant times log n. So this fraction is one over some large constant as you make as you know make the constant as large as we want. So we make this arbitrarily small, less than, less than one over hundred. And this is what we wanted. We wanted to somehow bound the probability that the paths intersect. So the probability one percent that they intersect, and then the rest of the situations, the previous calculation work. Uh, so this is the sketch of the main ideas that go into the proof. And uh, now, just to finish off, let me state a few open questions. Uh, so first, uh, what I sketched is this log n squared bound. By somehow the naive calculation, all, we, if we don't care about, if we don't notice that intersections can spoil everything, uh, give just log n instead of log n squared. And also there is a, uh, there is a low bound, lower bound that shows that uh, you cannot really get augmenting subgraphs in general with fewer than log n edges. So is it possible to get in, reduce log n squared to just log n? This is, this is an interesting open question, I think. Um, and uh, another open question is, uh, you know, what can we say about the uh, distributed algorithms? Uh, can we reduce the running time in the deterministic case to big O of log n, which again would be best possible for constant delta, say. Uh, right? Instead of it being just some polynomial in the logarithm, and the power in that polynomial is become, uh, you know, maybe not, not so nice. So can we reduce it to just linear in the logarithm? And this is for deterministic algorithms. For randomized algorithms, there is actually no reason why there shouldn't be even a sub-logarithmic uh, algorithm. Uh, this is entirely consistent uh, with everything we know about distributed, uh, randomized distributed algorithms at this point. So I think it's a good question, does such a randomized algorithm exist? And at this point, I'd like to stop. Thank you. Okay, so thank you a lot, Anton, for a beautiful talk. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe let's go uh, through questions if there are any in the audience. So yes, there is one question. Uh, uh, the question is uh, uh -huh. whether or not two paths could intersect in two adjacent edges. So uh, uh, let me. So the problem, wait, wait, where's the picture? The problem is that if you have two paths but they're using the same two colors, well, look, well, this path is essentially maximal with those colors, roughly speaking, right? So uh, uh, once you, and the coloring is proper. At every vertex, there is only one edge of this color. So, so if this edge is contained in a, in, a, in a path of colors alpha, beta, right? Then which edge would be attached to this this way? Well, it only has to be this one because the coloring is proper. There is only, only one edge that you can pick. And then this here, there is again, only one edge that can be picked. So once, if, if you give me two colors, alpha and beta, and a particular edge, I can essentially build the whole path from there, except that maybe, you know, it would be truncated at some point. Uh, yeah, did I, did, I, did I answer your question, Nicole? Uh. Hi, am I allowed to talk here? Yes. Okay, so um, you answered it partially, I think. So mm -hmm. what about, so you have the fan here that's X prime and mm -hmm. Y prime. So mm -hmm. aren't those not constrained to be a particular color? So couldn't you have red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, and then the fan, and then again for P prime, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue again? Uh, y yes. Uh, uh, let me, let me, uh, so, so what are you saying is, uh, there's red, red, blue, blue up to X prime and then, then what happens? Um, and, um, and then P prime is also the colors of red and blue. Oh yeah. Yeah. That could happen. That could and, happen. Uh -huh. And then they, but they intersect each other. Uh, Well, if, they, if, if, if this, um, I don't know, if this path P prime were to now intersect this one, then it would essentially contain all of these edges, right? Okay, I understand actually. Um, okay, good, thank you. Did I, did I, okay. Yes. Did I somehow, did. somehow manage to answer it? Uh, yes. So there are a little bit, you're right that there is a little bit of subtleties that I'm completely ignoring, having to do with what happens in the neighborhood of a, of a fan because somehow edges and fans change colors in unpredictable ways uh, that not, you know, in the path, somehow everything is pretty clear. Uh, you know, everything maybe the colors alpha beta just switch roles somehow, but everything looks more or less the same. Uh, but around a fan, things change a little bit in a more chaotic way. And it's, uh, 
uh, uh, and it's uh, one has to take care of that somehow separately. There is a there is a case study of what happens around the fan that that one has to do, uh, which is a bit more complicated. But I didn't want to uh, dwell on that in this sketch. Uh, okay, there is another question from uh, Louis. Uh, Having a little law of log n randomized round complexity would directly imply the measurable version of Wiesing theorem. Yes, that is correct. That would be a strengthening of measurable, that would imply the measurable Wiesing theorem. But we know that the measurable Wiesing theorem uh, is true. So this is consistent with our knowledge at this point. Uh, ah, another question. Uh, have, have you, uh, have you, from, from Richard, have you thought about coloring with an optimal number of colors, i.e. chi prime of G? Uh, no, is the answer. Uh, reducing from delta plus one to delta is something I have not, not, not considered, if it's possible. Uh, uh, so this is, this, is, this is an interesting question to ask, I think, right? At this point, uh, for which graphs can you actually reduce this to, to delta? Uh, ah, another question, uh, how about delta plus multiplicity? Oh, that, yeah, this is a very good question. So throughout this whole talk, I've been talking about simple graphs and delta plus one, but we know that Wiesing theorem also holds for multigraphs where the bound is in delta plus the maximum multiplicity of an edge. Uh, I believe that the same proof should work in that situation as well, but I did not uh, work through it. Somehow the, the details, even in the simple graph case, become quite uh, 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 complicated to, to, to work with. So I am 99% sure that you should be able to do a sim similar uh, argument for uh, multigraphs, but uh, it's not 100%. And I haven't tried to do it explicitly. Ah. Oh, this is another, another good question. List versions of these type of results. Well, first, if you can prove that a, a, a version of list of Wiesing theorem, a list version of Wiesing theorem, that would be quite, quite impressive. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, uh, now of course, all of this, you know, none of what I've been talking about uh, 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 applies, applies to, uh, uh, list colorings, but there are some bounds. Let me maybe go back. There are some bounds that do hold for list coloring. So, uh, uh, well, I guess I have to go all the way to almost the beginning. Uh, so, say, say this randomized algorithm for delta plus little o of delta h coloring. Uh, uh, I'm pretty certain that it also works for for list coloring. So this gives you. This, so we know that. Uh, uh, graphs of maximum degree delta, delta plus little of delta list edge colorable. And I think that you can do this with a random, with an efficient random, you know, sublogarithmic in this case, randomized uh, uh, distributed algorithm. I don't know if, uh, oh, and I think that also two delta minus one bounds uh, hold for, uh, actually, I'm not so sure about this, but some of the two delta minus one bounds definitely hold for, uh, 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 list coloring as well. Uh, I think this one does, for instance. Uh, but uh, I don't think that there is anything known about, say, deterministic algorithms for fewer than two delta minus one colors. Mm -hmm. I, 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 if, uh, at least nothing comes to mind. Uh, ah, yeah, this is a good question. Maybe I should have made this clear. The proof is completely combinatorial. This, uh, the descriptive combinatorics doesn't actually get involved in the, in, the, in the argument. It's just somehow the ideas that come in the proof first appeared in this other context, in the context of working with infinite graphs. So uh, this isn't an instance of a situation where you have to work with an infinite graph and then translate something. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, what I sketched for you is a combinatorial argument about finite graphs, but uh, 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 it is inspired by work in the infinite area setting. Hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I agree. Bipartite case is a, is, a, is a nice problem. Although it seems a bit maybe suspicious. Uh, can you tell a bipartite graph from a non-bipartite uh, one in some kind of local way? Right, yeah, Louis is right. Uh, delta coloring by apartheid graphs would require finding perfect matchings, which uh, I don't know if there's literally any work on finding perfect matchings in these graphs. And it certainly would be difficult. Oh yeah, feel free to unmute yourself so you and then, then we can talk. Uh. Talk, Rosio. Yeah, I, I hope people can unmute themselves. Aha, aha, but okay. But, but Ros, um, I see. I see. Uh, so, are there any any outstanding questions? The the chat was quite lively, so I'm not sure. Have, we can stop recording, but please, if there was any question, uh, any question f forgotten in the chat, then please uh, uh, either unmute yourself, or if you have a screaming baby at home, then just write it in the in the chat. Can I, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Can you hear me? Yeah, so every uh, vertex locally does some computation, which we mm -hmm. assume is happen happening in one step. Mm -hmm. Do you have some idea of how complex the com these computations actually become with your method? Uh, well, actually? Uh, let me see. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, mm, uh, I, okay, I believe that if you, uh, instead of a deterministic algorithm, you allow randomization. But the, the construction they described of building these um, uh, multi-step vising chains by picking random places in which to truncate the chain can be turned into a, uh, in a straightforward way into a, a randomized uh, uh, distributed algorithm for delta plus one H coloring. And uh, uh, in this algorithm, I think local computations remain polynomial in delta and log n. So it's somehow it's the same bound and the complexity of local computations as well, uh, I think. Uh, but if you once you want to make it into a deterministic algorithm, then I'm not sure anymore uh, whether it stays in that range, uh, because now somehow you need to really survey this whole you know just to define this hypergraph in which you're finding a, a, a approximating a maximum matching. Uh, yeah. You need to somehow survey all of the possible. Um, uh, you know, augmenting subgraphs within this radius ar around you. So essentially, you have to have knowledge of this, of really have knowledge of the entire graph of this radius. So this somehow now becomes a function of the number of vertices in the ball of radius polylogarithmic in n in the graph, which could yeah. be large. Okay, thanks. So I have some, one small question about uh, Boron version of Vizing. Is, is it open? It, I mean, is it? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, or? yeah, yeah, I, 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 can, I can answer this. Borel version of Vizing is false. Uh, by result of uh, Andrew Marks, you cannot do better than two delta minus one colors for Borel edge coloring. Ah. And is it somehow, can you relate that to the fact that there is this lower bound in log n for the deterministic uh, com uh, com round ah, complexity? That, that would be, uh, uh, 
it would be very nice if you could deduce the result of Gorel calings from uh, uh, the the log n bounds. So so maybe just for so that everybody knows what 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 everybody else knows what we're talking about. Uh, Louis is asking about this connection with descriptive combinatorics that I mentioned, and I said that Grebick and Pihurka wanted a measurable version of Bayesian's theorem. There is a potential stronger statement, which is called the Borel version of Bayesian's theorem, where so essentially. Uh, in measurable setting, we look at the structure of the probability space and we ignore sets of measure zero, which is what you do in the probability setting. Uh, and in the Borel setup, sets of measure zero somehow cannot be ignored. Uh, so that's the difference and that's what makes it more difficult. In some sense, it's like proving something for almost all graphs versus proving for all graphs. This is kind of the same type of dip difference. And so, uh, as, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, a Borel version of uh, Vising theorem false. This is the is, is false. This is the theorem of uh, uh, Andrew Marx. Uh, in fact, so in this you know, Borel sense, where sets of measure zero cannot be ignored, one cannot do better than to, than the greedy bound of two delta minus one commas. And this somehow parallels, as as Louis is pointing out, this is parallels paralleling. What is this? Uh, this situation where once you go below to delta minus one colors, there is a logarithmic lower bound on the uh, uh, runtime of the algorithm. So uh, on the one hand, one could ask, well, maybe there is some, so it seems like there is, as I said, there are some analogies between the areas and the same, these two areas, and it seems like there is some connection. And it would be interesting to have a connection going from here to Borel colorings because uh, you know this is a combinatorial proof, whereas the proof that the Borel coloring was two delta minus two colors might not exist, uh, involves some very sophisticated machinery. And, uh, you know, it requires on, uh, somehow, somehow this is, as I said, you know, these are infinite graphs and the proof really depends on, uh, uh, you know, this whole structure of different cardinalities. It does, it goes well beyond just cardinality of continuum. Somehow uh, the, the, there's this really chain of power sets that one has to build and, and work with. So if you could avoid that somehow, that would be that would be nice, right? But this this is not something that we know how to do uh, at the moment. On the other hand, I mentioned that there are some formal implications between these two areas, and in particular, once you know that there is no uh, that Borel colorings of two delta with Borel edge colorings with two delta minus two color, colors might not exist. This implies this lower bound somehow. So from this, so somehow this is this. Uh, uh, in this uh, 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 plot twist, you can get a proof of this combinatorial result about uh, uh, colorings with you know algorithms for two delta minus two edge coloring using this argument with this whole chain of infinite sets of larger and larger cardinalities. So uh, this is this is an interesting turn of turn of event. Uh, of course, one yeah, one might suspect that one could go also the other way, but this is not known. Uh, yeah. Did this answer your question, Louis? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so if there are no more questions in this Form, formal part, I think it's more than appropriate to thank uh, Anton for this beautiful, beautiful talk. So I will unmute everyone and we can give him a, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining and thank you for organizing this. This is, uh, this is a great undertaking. Uh, and it's nice that you're keeping all of us still in touch with uh, uh, what is going on.